Despite some glaring flaws and very legitimate complaints, I actually really like this mini laptop. It's a super cool form factor, and now that I've owned it for about a month and a half, let's talk about it. Recently, I've seen a lot of portable external displays popping up on the market, and this is a pretty similar concept to that, except instead of having one display separate, it's two displays built into one device. The keyboard and the trackpad are separate. You can use an on-screen keyboard, but unlike the Lenovo version, it doesn't have dedicated software for a nice on-screen keyboard, so it's a little bit wonky to work around. I'll show you more about that in a bit. In fact, many of the quirks and minor complaints I have about this device are due to Windows 11 being Windows 11 and not being built for this form factor. Before getting into more of this review, I just want to quickly answer a couple questions that I had before purchasing. Number one, I'd envision this device as the perfect drawing tablet with my art on the lower screen and a reference or a video on the top, but unfortunately there is no pressure sensitivity, so don't buy the stylus. Secondly, the keyboard and mouse combo that comes with this device is not bespoke. It's just a generic Bluetooth keyboard and mouse, and while it works fine, it does not fit properly with this device. It kind of sticks out to the side. Finally, the last question I had is, is it a legitimate i3? And from my testing, absolutely. The i3 is substantially faster than the N100, and that's the main reason I got this device. But anyways, let's get into the meat and potatoes of the review, go to the voiceover and check this thing out a little bit closer. I had two reasons for getting this PC. First of all, apparently I just love burning money buying expensive and untested generic products. At the time of buying this, it was a new product with no ratings at all. Even now, two months later, it's only been bought 14 times. My second reason for buying this, well, I just wanted something better than the N100 in a super compact form factor. So here we are, this incredibly quirky mini PC, and I just think it's neat. These unbranded devices really lack the care and attention that goes into mainline bigger brands, and that shows in a bunch of little tiny issues. I put a list of things I like and dislike about this mini PC. I'll go over most of these in more detail in the video, but just in case, here's the list. Now let's dive a little bit more in depth into those things, starting with the form factor. From the outside, this device is more like two tablets strapped together than a regular laptop. Most of the body is solid metal, but there's this weird ridge on the back with a sort of faux leather texture. It slides up and down when you open the device, it kind of looks like opening the spine of a book. Looking closer, behind this leather piece reveals a hinge that otherwise would not be protected, as well as some ribbon cables. The left side of the computer has its ports, a barrel jack for charging, two Type-C ports, one of which has display out as well as power in. Doesn't seem to support Thunderbolt though. A full-sized USB and the power button. There is no headphone jack and I wish that they had a headphone jack instead of this barrel charger. The build quality I'm overall quite happy with it, although I do question the durability of this hinge material and the sliding mechanism. Mainly it seems like the kind of thing that will attract dust and dirt getting in between the seam here and it already has a little bit of a creak to it, even though I've only owned this computer for over a month. Also, another result of this awkward hinge is this device can't do the sort of typical two-in-one yoga pose. It can't fold over itself into a tent. Other similar generic dual screens can do this, so it's a bit of a shame that the feature is missing. The laptop does also pass the one-handed opening test, but just by a little bit, a slim margin. Let's take a look at the screens now. I don't actually have tools to measure the displays, but to my eyes they look really good. The color and calibration matches despite them almost certainly being two different panels. I don't think most people would notice the differences in practice, just under careful inspection. One of the two panels has a slightly worse viewing angle, and on camera it also shows up with a little bit of flicker. The other one does not. Also worth noting, that flickering is not visible in person. I've had moments when there is a software error and one of the screens defaults to a 90 degree rotation while the other does not. And in things like the BIOS and splash screen, the two screens just mirror each other. It's kind of interesting actually. Since Windows sees one display as built in and the second display as external, rotating the device only rotates the one that counts as the built in display. The other one needs to be manually rotated in the display setting in order to have both at 90 degrees and I just found turning rotation off and rotating them manually the best way to do this. There are some other software quirks as well. The first quirk is kind of a shame. First thing I did was install an antivirus program and check out the Windows installation that came with this computer. Whoops. Way to go, Topton. Whatever you did to the Windows install is super sketchy. And 
I did test this device before reinstalling to see if there was any software configuration or extra software that had been added to make the computer more usable. And I didn't really find anything that would add value to the computer. So I just wiped it and reinstalled Windows. And thankfully reinstalling Windows fixed the virus infection as well, I did not need to download additional drivers. Windows eventually figured it out for itself. I did, however, need to recalibrate the dual touch display. If the two touch screens are reversed or touching one screen inputs on the other screen, go into the old style control panel, choose tablet PC settings, click on setup, and then press enter on a keyboard to skip the first screen. Touch the second screen with your finger and it should be good to go. Windows 11 is far and away the biggest hindrance to this device, and that's because it really only expects one built-in screen, perhaps one second screen, and at most one of those two screens being the touch screen. One example of this is with Windows's on-screen keyboard, which defaults to being on whatever window your app is on. So there's no way to keep that keyboard pinned to the bottom and input text to an app on the top. And at best, with the mini version of the keyboard, you can drag it down to the bottom, type from there, but Tapping on the top again will bring that keyboard back to the top display. Here's what that would look like if you had actual software like Lenovo does with their dual screen laptop. The keyboard and virtual trackpad is pinned to the bottom screen and gives it that real laptop like feel without needing an actual keyboard. You can pin Windows virtual trackpad to the bottom and the smaller keyboard, but that smaller keyboard is worse than most phone keyboards even if it does have swipe text input. Another quirk of this computer is the wake function when the displays are turned off. Even with the computer still running, it's hard to get the displays to turn themselves back on once they've turned off for power saving. Clicking on a Bluetooth keyboard or trackpad will turn them back on, but the touchscreen doesn't turn them back on, tapping the power button doesn't turn them back on, and the only way I could find to get the screens back on was to press and hold the power button for 5 seconds. The problem is, if you press and hold it too long, the computer will reset. The only way to hold this computer like a book is in one orientation because the other way hits the power button and causes the computer to turn off or reset. Holding it this way, however, blocks the air output, which can be problematic for thermals. We'll see that in a second. Finally, the last sort of Windows software issue is window management. If you're in touch only mode, there's no way to get the bottom app back up onto the top screen without opening the virtual trackpad because dragging that app up simply makes Windows think that app should take up the entire display instead of sending it to the top screen. All of these things are kind of a sign of a computer that is underdeveloped with no R&D and just thrown onto the market. As I said in the introduction, this is kind of a mid-tier Windows tablet with a second screen strapped onto it, and that really shows in terms of just the software care. There is none. In terms of the keyboard and accessories that are bundled, they are not designed specifically for this device and it kind of shows. Again, it's one of those little care issues. The one included is fine as far as cheap Bluetooth keyboards go, but the typing experience leaves much to be desired. It's kind of clicky, but there's not very good stabilization. The keycaps have lots of wobble. The trackpad is actually decent in terms of response, and it feels quite good to use despite being plastic, plastic cover instead of glass. This also just happens to be the limpest trackpad I've ever used. Like, look at this, it just wobbles back and forth. There's no friction holding it in place. Since the keyboard is not designed for this device, it's too long and sticks out the side. Bringing the keyboard along is basically a necessity for any serious typing, and since this is more of a productivity-focused machine than gaming or extended battery life, it means packing the keyboard requires a much larger bag to keep everything together than just the laptop. Since this laptop is similar in size to an 11-inch iPad, perhaps a Bluetooth keyboard and trackpad designed for that device would fit a lot better. With a better keyboard, this computer could be used as an actual laptop in single-screen mode, with the keyboard on top of the lower display. Now let's talk about the biggest downside to this device, which is the battery life. The standard battery life for video playback is less than 3 hours, and with the bottom screen turned off, I could get more like 4 to 5 hours, almost doubling the battery life. It's a shame the battery life is so poor, because I wouldn't even expect it to last through half a workday, a lecture, heck it might not even last through a whole D&D round. When gaming, with one screen disabled, that number drops to around an hour. What's it like to use in day-to-day -day situations? Well, from a performance perspective, I noticed virtually no slowdowns while doing any basic task. 
I like this form factor for having notes on one screen and my document on the other, or having a YouTube video playing on one screen with my work on the other, or having Photoshop on one screen and a reference on the other, you get the point. The increase in productivity to having two screens is remarkable, and the i3 handles multitasking with office tasks and media playback very breezily. The form factor definitely takes a little bit of getting used to, it's kind of awkward as an actual laptop on my lap or on the couch or something, but I've had better luck standing the device on an armrest of the couch and using the keyboard on my lap instead of being all compressed together. Really I think the novelty of this device is the most interesting part. Portable external displays are really inexpensive and widely available now, and they don't compromise the battery life or typing experience of an ordinary laptop. However, this device is kind of the opposite mindset, where instead of packing along a separate portable display, that second display is always built in, totally mandatory, and you're packing along a separate keyboard and mouse. This laptop is one of the best doom scrolling devices I've ever owned because I can have a video playing and just social media until I'm super angry at the world. Right, so let's do some benchmarks, starting with the storage benchmark. The included storage is pretty low end. It may plug into an NVMe port, but it just runs at SATA speeds. You can see it on screen. Now Geekbench 6, here's the results. I'm going to compare that to the N100. Cinebench 2024, same thing. You can see the results on screen here. These results are quite a bit higher and Honestly, I cannot overstate how much more performant the i3 is versus the N100 in that last mini laptop I used. It's important to keep in mind that this i3 is still a low-end processor meant more for office tasks and light gaming rather than intense AAA titles, but let's check out some games anyways. The screens are both 60Hz, but with this i3 and its integrated graphics, I wouldn't expect to be pushing that too much. I chose these games because I know they run on the Steam Deck. But the question is, how well will they run on this little baby i3? And Spyro Reignited Trilogy 720p low is absolutely playable. Unfortunately, this laptop has some thermal issues when it comes to gaming. Regular day-to-day -day use, you don't really notice it. The fan spins up occasionally, but nothing like this. That fan is howling, and the CPU is locked at 100 degrees Celsius. I tried disabling the lower screen and locking the frame rate to 60 frames per second to try and get it to drop below 100 Celsius, but nothing really helps. That rear fan is super small and it's choked out by the little tiny vent holes. So just for the sake of doing the thing, here is 1080p low, and yeah, this is unplayable. Not only is it often below 30 frames per second, but everything feels super chunky and it's quite hard to react in time to the enemies. Realistically, if you're going to play any newer games on this, it's going to be at 720p. The reality with gaming is that this computer overheats very quickly while it's plugged in, and the battery drains very quickly while it's not. Gaming at 720p is possible, and I would also suggest frame rate locking to 30fps in higher end titles so the computer isn't working as hard and generating as much heat. Unfortunately, that little fan inside doesn't seem to be doing too much. I put my hand next to the air output and it didn't feel warm at all but the computer was reporting, you know, 99, 100 degrees Celsius. So that's, that's not great. Honestly, other than the fact that the CPU is pegged to 100 degrees C, this is a very playable experience. I'm not noticing any spikes in the frame time graph. Also do keep in mind that the vast majority of these game shots, as well as benchmarks, were ran with the lower screen disabled to reduce the amount of heat that it outputs, because having that screen turned on, of course, increases the heat, and this cooling system can't keep up. I theorize that the cooling system is meant for the N100 version of this laptop and was not upgraded for this higher end, hotter processor. Some of the heat issues are definitely caused by the charging circuitry. When the computer's plugged in, the area around the charger gets quite hot, and that's when the computer is constantly maxing at 100 degrees Celsius. Unplugged and on battery, it was often 5 to 10 degrees Celsius cooler depending on the game. In terms of media consumption, the single built-in speaker, it's loud enough, but it is kind of muddy and has basically no bass. I'll use it for minimal work in a quiet environment, but I wouldn't want to watch a whole movie on it. Unfortunately, there's no headphone jack to easily plug in an external speaker. So here, have a listen. This is what it sounds like.
This is definitely the best webcam I have ever seen. My god, is it glorious. Okay, well, that wasn't really fair because most webcams suck with strong studio lighting, so here it is outside on a gloomy autumn day. Or just in my bathroom, which has arguably the best lighting of any room in my house. In conclusion, I was super excited to review this device, and even with its kind of awkwardness, I just think it's neat. After using this dual screen laptop extensively, I looked into the Lenovo version, which is over three times the price, and I said, nope, it's not worth the compromises at that price. At that price point, I'd rather get a much more powerful small laptop or tablet and bring that secondary screen along with me when I need it. There is something to be said for having two screens in one device though, especially if you are intensely productivity focused. And this laptop really is a head turner that gets attention everywhere it goes. Many of the software issues I can find workarounds for, especially that better on-screen keyboard. It's really a shame though that it doesn't have an active pen, and that's something that is much harder to fix. If you've watched this video all the way through, there's a good chance this device is something you're interested in, and I would really heavily weigh the quirks, benefits, and downsides before considering it over other alternatives. Really, the main downside is that if there is issues, it may be impossible to get support. Only 14 of these have sold on AliExpress, perhaps because they're cheaper on Alibaba, but that also means that this is a low-run boutique device from who knows what manufacturer, whether batteries will be available in the future or parts or anything like that. It, yeah, probably not. In the end, after nearly two months of owning this device, I found myself often turning off that second screen and just using it in one screen mode because... I wanted to watch a video or do some single task where that second display would have just taken away from the precious battery life. But when I did need that second display, it was highly valuable. And it was those moments where I thought, wow, this device is so cool. Hey, thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to the channel. See you in the next one. Yeah. See, that's that's how it is and it just sits here it just it just sits here there's no like there's, n there's nothing holding it just 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 weight and friction